morning, everyone. I'm Lakshmi, <clears throat> for those of you that I don't know. It's a joy to be here with you this morning. You know, I've had the pleasure of sitting with this reading for the last seven days, really contemplating um, the difference between intuition and living from a place of intuition's flow um, and the intellect, the discerning qualities of the mind. Um, and I found myself a few days ago in the midst of a little game with Divine Mother that I didn't know I was playing until much later, where I would reflect at different points in the day um, when I had a moment to sort of stop and breathe on all of the actions and the thoughts and uh, you know everything that I'd done throughout the day and assessing or reflecting, you know, where was my consciousness in the midst of that? Was I acting from a place of the discerning quality of the mind? Or was I centered in the heart? Was I acting from a place of pure intuition, of the flow of God's love? Um, and I have to say that it was a very busy and intense week, and I found that the scales were tipped in favor of the intellect, of discernment. Um, and it's so often that we can get caught up in that, that we just go through the flow of our day, forgetting to plug back into the divine, forgetting to ask the divine to help guide us in every particular moment um, for the mundane things as well as the larger things. And it wasn't until yesterday when I was able to really slow down and spend the whole day with Divine Mother and spend the whole day with these readings, or this particular reading in the two scriptures that are offered to us, that I really began to understand the power in Christ's words when he says, suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. This is the true source of our power. That's the invitation that Christ is giving to us with this reading. Because when we approach the divine, God is not interested in our credentials. God is not interested in how well we can articulate the teachings or the things that we know. He's not interested in how much we have studied. All of those are qualities that we carry with us in order to lift our consciousness. But everything has to come to the heart and through the heart. This is where God lives. That's why in this reading, Swami Kriyananda can say to us that intuition is the soul's power of knowing God. And this is why Sri Yukteswar, who's behind me, Yoga, uh, Paramahansa Yogananda's guru, so famously said to us that you cannot take one step forward on the spiritual path without awakening the heart's feeling, without devotion. We must bring our energy up to the heart. We must live from that place of, the, of intuitive flow because this is the source of our power. We get fooled and we think that it exists out there, that there's something outside of us that's going to bring us our strength, that if we can just get things right, if I can just do all of the things that I need to do in a day and then rest and be happy, then I'll feel strong and powerful, then I'll have everything I need. But it doesn't come from outside, it comes from within and it must be cultivated and shared from the intuition of the heart. Because when we're living in that flow of divine love, we realize that we are a part of everything, that the divine has manifested this world and nothing can exist outside of her play, outside of her desires. So every thought, every action, every circumstance, we begin to find ways to approach them with calm, with calmness, with joy, with acceptance. It's the discerning faculty of the mind that begins to fragment that. As soon as we bring discernment into the conversation, rather than receptivity, opening up to the divine with a heart and saying, I take whatever you give me, that receptive quality, as soon as we shift into the discernment, and we'll talk about how discernment is necessary. Swami Kriyananda is not suggesting to us that we shun discernment altogether, but that we begin to merge that. And the moment that we can merge that with the heart's love and act with discerning qualities through the divine intuition that flows from the heart, that's the ticket. That's how we find God. Because discernment pulls us back into ourselves in one form or another. I was thinking about how we easily use examples of discernment pulling us into likes and dislikes with the things we know that we shouldn't be doing, but we want, kind of want them anyway, and we say, oh, I know that's a like or a dislike, and I'm working on it, and I'll get there. But when the reading says that the intellect is easily fooled, I was thinking about all the subtle ways that this happens. You know, for example, 
If I'm choosing to have a salad for lunch, which is full of fresh uh, vegetables and raw vegetables, full of life and vitality, and I'm choosing that to feed my body, to help uplift my consciousness, all positive steps that are leading me toward God, how many times did I just say I in that moment? The moment that we allowed the intellectual faculties to enter into our consciousness, the ego is present. And of course, why suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God? Why Christ is imploring us to open our hearts with childlike receptivity and vulnerability is because what we're ultimately trying to do as spiritual seekers is begin to dissolve that ego so we can flow with whatever Divine Mother asks of us. And the carping spirit, that discernment, that criticism, right? The carping spirit takes us one step further into criticisms. It's not a criticism to discern to have a salad. For all, intent, you know, for all purposes, that's a positive thing to do. But the more that we build that habitual muscle of discerning, rather than taking a step back and saying, Divine Mother, where are we flowing today? What can I feel from my heart? How can I share love? Because the love that comes from the heart is indiscriminate. It's impartial, it loves everyone and everything equally. Well, isn't that the source of our power? Rather than making the choices day to day that we think are going to bring us into positions to find God, to be successful, whatever it may be. And I was thinking of the story, many of you will know this story very well, of Ananda Moima, and um, it's told from the perspective of one of her disciples who fell a bit into the carping spirit. And he was criticizing some of Ma's um, attitudes as being a little bit flighty, that she wasn't really ever able to just stay in one place, that she was always scattered about. And then one day they were going on a picnic. Again, this is what many of you will know. And they're sitting down and they've found their spot and they've packed all of their food and they've spread everything out. And for comic relief, I always imagine that it's the moment the disciple is about to take a bite that she stands up and she says, we must go over here. And she walks over to a little tree and she holds out her arms or her, the palms of her hand and a little bird falls into her hands. And she looks at the bird and she spends a few brief moments of pure love with the bird and then the bird dies. And she says, this is why we came here today. And if the disciple had been caught up in that carping spirit, in that discernment, in that moment of, well, we said we were going to have a picnic, why, are we, why aren't we sitting here? They would have missed that opportunity to experience pure love, even just a, a, a tiny moment of it. And of course, that's what we're here to do. That's what Yogananda and Swami Kriyananda teach us is that when, the, when our life is over, when the end of our lives are over and we are finally merging back into the infinite, all of the moments that matter, the only moments that we'll remember and hold on to are the ones where we were touching the divine, where we were tapping into pure love. All the rest of it goes away. It, it just, it gets flooded away like a river. Right? And so I was thinking about that's where the discernment comes into play. It's not that we don't need to act and discern, but how do we constantly merge that discernment with divine love, with intuition, with openness and receptivity? And uh, you know, a story that I will share, um, a few weeks ago I had the privilege about, I think it was three weeks ago now, to spend the weekend in Yosemite. And um, I was there with three other devotees and we had a wonderful time. And we drove up early in the morning on Saturday and we decided to do a hike up to the top of Nevada Falls. And so we took um, a trail called the Mist Trail. And I became the pseudo leader because I'd done the trail before, but I actually hadn't. So we were just kind of all together. Shama was with me, so she knows this story. We were all just kind of together setting off on a journey where we sort of knew where we were headed. Um, and we didn't get lost, that's not where the story goes. But in the midst of it, I was reflecting the other day on all of the little choices that we made along the way, all of the discernments that we made. We stopped to fill up our water bottles and discussed how much water should we have, does everyone have enough? Okay, and then we set on the next step. And I could notice at the times when, you know, the, the moleskin that I'd used to wrap up my feet wasn't quite working and I should probably stop and readjust so that I don't get br uh, blisters on my feet, or the moments when we're standing in line and there are a hundred people up in front of you and you kind of want to go faster but you can't really go faster and if you're going to barrel through people then it's going to create a danger. Just one step after another, all of those little discernments that I had to make. 
none of which in this case were the carping spirit because you're out in nature and you're there and you're just enjoying the beauty of it, but little irks and little tweaks sometimes along the way, as well as joys, but decisions, all of them, discerning faculties of the intellect. And then we reached the top and we sat um, just inches, about as close as you could get to the top of the waterfall without actually falling into it, where all you could hear, all you could feel, all four of us were sitting on this little tiny rock that was protruding out over the waterfall. And uh, now at one point, Shama said, I think we should probably move. And we actually all just stepped back. But for a few, for a good 10 minutes or so, we were just sitting there, and all you could hear was the thunder of the water right next to you, just inches away, and feel the spray and the mist. And all you could see were the water walls of granite, the walls and the expansiveness of uh, nature surrounding you. And the ego dissolved completely. Every single one of those steps that we took, those were necessary discernments to get us to our goal up at the top. But those discernments, the moment we were there, all of it washed away. All of it was just ripped away with the current of that waterfall, and we were left sitting with Divine Mother, sitting in that space of just pure joy. This is the power of living from the heart, of living in intuition's flow, of opening ourselves to that receptivity of God and knowing that everything is a part of us, that everything flows from that one true source. And the discernments that we take along the way, it's knowing we have to act, we have to wake up and go to work and um, make food and do our dishes and all of the things that we need to do. Um, on a daily basis in order to live. We live in the world, and the world, this is a world of duality. It is a materialistic world, so we must act in it. Right? That was very um, strong, that's in Yogananda's teachings. That we are not here to renounce and pull away from the world, that we are disciples and we are spiritual seekers here to live in the world, and we will live lives of deep activity and deep meditation. So the question is, how do we act in a way that's always bringing us back to that childlike state, back to that place of living in Divine Mother's intuitive flow. And it's the ability to ask in every moment, Divine Mother, what do you want from me? Divine Mother, where should we go today? Divine Mother, how can I share your love? If we're continuing to come back and call to mind Divine Mother in every activity, we begin to know and to live from that place of understanding that Divine Mother is the doer that we are just her tool to share her love in the world, and that each of our actions, each of the decisions that we make can be made with Divine Mother rather than running parallel to her and then just plugging back in when we sit down to meditation or when we need a moment to pray or when we have the time to think about it. You know, I was... Um, reflecting on my day, Friday morning, in, on, in a very intense and long week, um, Friday morning was the culminating day, and um, I was reflecting on my alarm, my alarm went off at five o'clock, and the first thought that I had was, can I snooze um, for 10 minutes, or nine minutes, however long it works, and I started doing the math in my head, okay, if I get up at 5.09, am I still going to be able to do all the things I need to do in order to get to work, did it all going on and on, I ultimately decided not only to snooze once, but twice, but I still got to work on time. Then after meditation, I started counting back. I knew I needed to be at work at 7.10, so what time do I need to leave? It's 6.30 now. Then in the car, which way should I go? Should I take this road or that? All of a sudden, and halfway on my ride to work, I realized that in that hour between meditation and where I was in that moment, I hadn't thought about Divine Mother once. And I was still on the road to finishing my responsibilities, to getting all of the tasks done that I needed to do. But how much better would that experience have been if I could tap in to that flow of intuition, if I could say, Divine Mother, which way should we drive to work to today? Divine Mother, what time should we leave? I didn't ask her if she wanted to snooze because I knew the answer would be no. <laughs> but all of the other, uh, are, were, all the other questions were an open invitation. That's what I was thinking yesterday. <laughs> So again, it's that reality. This is the simple tasks that we can do moment by moment in order to bring God into our experiences, in order to open the heart and enter into that state of divine love that we can share with everyone and everything. I'll leave you with one final story. It really um, highlights this concept, and it's the story of King Janaka and Sukadeva. And we heard this story the first time that I heard it was this summer um, at our Living Discipleship Program. So some of you will remember it. 
Um, and so Sukhdeva is the son of Byasa, who wrote the Mahabharata. So he was an extremely highly evolved soul. And when it was time for him to find his, his guru, his father, Byasa, sent him to King Janaka. So Sukhdeva enters um, the kingdom of King Janaka, and he sees King Janaka surrounded by material uh, objects, by women who are fanning him um, and eating food, and he immediately enters into the carping spirit and scoffs the king and says, why would my father have sent me to such a material king? And in that criticism, he leaves the, the kingdom in search of a, a different guru. But King Janaka was, an extreme, was a highly evolved soul, and he heard and felt the thoughts of Sukhdeva, and so he called for him to come back, and he did. And the two of them sat down and started talking about God and being in divine communion and sharing that joy. And in the midst of their conversation, one of the king's messengers runs in and says, uh, Sire, your kingdom, the, the surrounding area of your kingdom is on fire. There's a threat. Please come help us. And he says, please, I'm speaking speaking about the divine and communing with the divine with my new friend. You guys handle the fire. We are here together in divine communion. And they continue on. And then the messengers come back. And this time they say, the fire has entered the kingdom, the, the castle walls or the kingdom's walls. And uh, the threat is more immediate. Please, what should we do? And he says again, please, I am here speaking of the divine. Do not bother us. We are communing with God. And finally, the scorched uh, messengers come back in one final time and they say, the, the flames have reached your castle. They're just behind us. And you can see the flames coming, running, uh, come rushing in. And they implore him, please, sire, run away. And he says, you run, save yourselves. My friend and I are speaking of God. And Sukhdeva is sitting there again, a highly evolved soul, but not perfect yet, starting to get a little bit nervous. And then finally the flames come and they start to uh, dance on the stack of books that he has next to him. And Sukhdeva can't help it himself and he puts out the flames. And in that moment, King Janaka, with a wave of his hand, el uh, eliminates all of the, the fire, it's gone. And he says, ah, you considered me to be a material king, but look, I was calm and collected as my entire castle, as my entire kingdom was being engulfed by flames. I was accepting, I was standing calmly and accepting in a state of the divine. Your books were in jeopardy and you couldn't stay calm in that faith. And Sukhdeva bows at his feet and realizes that this is his guru. And the point of the story that I want to come to um, is later that day or later that week, um, King Janaka gives Sukadeva a test and he asks him to hold two oil lamps in each of the palms of his hands and he fills the oil lamps to the brim and he says, go through my castle and look at everything, see everything, experience everything, but do not drop a single drop of oil as you do this. And Sukhdeva begins walking around very carefully, comes back triumphantly two hours later, not having dropped a single uh, drop of the oil. And King Janaka asks him, what did you see? And Sukhdeva says, I couldn't I see anything. I was only focused on the oil lamps. And he says, ah, you didn't pass my test, and sends him out again. And this time Sukhdeva comes back 10 hours later, not having dropped a single drop of oil, but having experienced everything and being able to tell in minute detail everything that existed in King Janaka's um, castle. And King Janaka praises him and he says, this is the state of being that you must live in. And this is the lesson for all of us as well. The ability to live so firmly rooted in the concentration of God that your devotion doesn't drop a single drop of that oil, that your love of God is filled to the brim and your concentration is ever focused there, but that you don't forget the activity that you have in the world, the people that are under your charge. And this is what he was saying. I am living in the material world. I am working on the material plane, but I am ever in the consciousness of God. And that's the test for each one of us and the test that Sukhdeva was finally able to pass, to hold the lamps of his devotion up to God while experiencing and working and acting in the world. Yogananda told us that the highest prayer, one of the highest prayers that we can pray is, Lord, I will reason, I will will, and I will act. 
but guide thou my reason, will, and activity toward the highest good and all. This is the state of consciousness that we can carry with us. This is what the Gita is suggesting to us when it says, it is uh, sublime wisdom comes through grasping the mind and perceiving the intuition of the heart. When we can merge these two and act in a space of knowing that God is the doer behind everything, of holding God ever consciously in our heart as we go through every single moment of our lives, then we are living in the full strength of our power, then we are owning everything that we can own to offer up to the divine, just like it was so perfect, of course it's perfect, the um, affirmation that was read today, our little joy gets merged into the infinite joy, or the beautiful whispers that was read to us today, that the, the honey in our hive is offered up into the divine. Everything we do in every moment, whether coming from the faculties of the intellect or coming from the heart, is a affirming our oneness with God, is affirming that reality. So that is what I offer to each one of you, is an opportunity to move through the day and just continue to ask in every moment, Lord, guide my reason. Lord, guide my will. Guide my activity that I may become ever closer to the divine. This intuition is simple. Intuition is love. Love is the only reality. Nothing exists beyond that. Everything else is just a blink of an eye that will slowly fall away. So let us always come back to that place of living in God, of choosing love, of offering ourselves in every moment to the divine grace and the divine will. God bless you. Shame.